National Forests have been in existence for over 80 years now. Uh, in those early years, uh, we're inclined to believe that it was in fact an era of abundance. Uh, our job was primarily custodial. We worried about grazing uh, uh, permittees. We, we worried that people had enough posts and poles to develop their, uh, their homesteads. Uh, we were concerned that, uh, of trespass cases. And, uh, and when we got into difficulties in those days, uh, it's been said that we could probably uh, solve most of our problems with a handshake and a cup of coffee and, uh, and sometimes a piece of pie. Now, over the years, as, as, uh, as we've uh, evolved, we find that the, uh, the demands on, on the national forests are, are much greater now. The conflict and the controversies uh, seem to be a way of life with us. Uh, uh, we're, in, we're under much more scrutiny than we ever were in, in our history. And because of that, uh, our job as managers of these national forests has been, have become very, very much more complex. During the planning period that we've gone through here in the last number of years, we've made every effort to involve our publics uh, and try, we tried certainly hard to listen to what they had to say, and the uh, uh, result of that was the forest plans that are now uh, available to uh, throughout the national forest system. I'm hopeful that uh, as we proceed, we'll find the proper mix of, uh, of integrated resource management that certainly can be more satisfying and, and beneficial to uh, not only to the land, but certainly to the people that use those lands. What makes it difficult is trying to mix and mesh all the different needs that people have on that piece of land. And needless to say, over the last 10, 15 years, what we've seen is a land base that has stayed the same size, but we've seen greatly increased number of uses, different types as well as the amount of use. As a district ranger, I see some things that have changed drastically in the last 10, 15 years where prior the district ranger would get out on the ground and be in the woods more often and meet, meet the users personally, there's becoming less than that. And the primary reason is that the district ranger has taken on the role of being the person who coordinates and tries to make these various uses match, but those are things that have to be done. The National Forests are created around 1905 and the, one of the primary purposes was to ensure a future supply of wood. Today we manage that wood resource along with several other uses on an equal or balanced basis. We, we manage the timber resource to provide the, the needs of our country for wood for homes, for paper, for furniture, and for firewood, posts and poles, any number of uses much of the wood comes from the National Forest. In fact, over half of the wood that is used for homes in this country comes from softwood saw timber on National Forest land. On this forest, we manage about one-fourth of the land for timber management. We typically harvest trees when they reach maturity, and come back in after that and plant or rely on natural regeneration such as seeds from adjacent trees to ensure that a new crop of trees is established. It's important to realize that we can manage our timber resource carefully and professionally and have it been done so in a manner that's totally compatible with other resource values such as water, recreation, and wildlife. Trees are a very valuable resource they're valuable to each of us as we live our everyday lives. They're a renewable resource. It's a crop that can be managed, and we can do that in the future years so we can all benefit from the wood and also keep our national forests healthy and productive. People have 
spent a lot of time and effort in different ways trying to protect water quality. For instance, the Forest Service um, uses soil and water conservation practices when we uh, design roads and build roads. We uh, try to get the cattle to not walk along the stream banks and break them down. We try to control how much logging goes on in a watershed in order to prevent flooding from occurring after the logging has taken place. There are many hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of people who will use this very water for their domestic water supply to irrigate their crops, perhaps to water some livestock, to float in boats and canoes and rafts, and just in general to enjoy having good, clean, pure water available for many purposes. I believe that water is one of the most important resources of national forests and um, I feel very lucky to spend my, my time on the job doing everything I can to protect and maintain that good water quality and quantity for all of you. National forest lands we're looking at here provide some excellent wildlife habitat and habitat is essentially just three major things. It's cover, it's water, and it's forage. And these lands that we're looking at here are all winter range for big game animals in the northern Yellowstone area. Winter range areas are low, low in elevation, generally under 7,500 feet. They don't get a lot of snow build up on them. There's quite a bit of grass available, shrubs available for elk, deer, bighorn sheep, bison, and all the other large big game animals to eat. Uh, they're essential for the survival of the populations. We have lots of area in the national forest, but much of it is very high in the winter and the animals are concentrated at these lower elevations. So the management of this is really critical for our big game populations on the national forest. The Yellowstone winter range here is a big chunk of ground, 200,000 plus acres. It's Part of it's in ownership with Yellowstone National Park. The remainder of it is primarily national forest ownership. And it's really a complex management issue to deal with animals that are crossing boundaries that have no fences. On one side, they're protected from hunting and any type of use, while on the national forest, we make recreational use of the animals and we have hunting seasons here. We have three agencies really involved in the management of the, the entire Yellowstone area. That's Yellowstone National Park, the National Forest, and also the Montana Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Fire has always been a natural part of this area here. We have a natural burning cycle of about every 35 years is what has been predicted for the entire winter range area. In the last 100 years, the Forest Service, we've done a pretty good job of putting fires out. But at the same time, we do need fire as an essential part of management. And the fire produ produces much more palatable grasses. It removes brush that crowds out grasses where it makes it unavailable to some of these big game animals that are using the area. And that's the direct habitat part. We have an indirect habitat part and that's where we try to coordinate things such as timber management and range management with the wildlife. You know, if we want to do some harvest of a, of a timber stand. You know, how much of that can we take without in, impacting wildlife? Uh, what type of shape should that unit be in? Should we seed that unit afterwards with some palatable grass, grasses? Those are indirect improvements that can be done on the national forest. This is grizzly bear country. The national forest have about 65% of the area where grizzly bears still exist today in the lower 48 states. Now the grizzly bear is a threatened species and when I say threatened, this comes from a piece of legislation called the Endangered Species Act that occurred in 1973. This was a congressional action and a threatened species 
is one is a species that could become endangered of existence if things aren't done you know to provide its habitat and to protect the animal itself our role as far as the forest service is to provide good habitat and this is you know typical of excellent grizzly bear habitat and to try to keep people and grizzly bears apart because more often than not you know if we have a conflict the bear usually winds up losing another endangered species on the forest is the peregrine falcon and the forest service has been very involved in the recovery effort where we're actually bringing in young birds and relocating them in, into the wild As a multi-use land management agency, the Forest Service is responsible for maintaining and wherever possible, improving the quality of the fisheries in our national forests. Nationwide, some 60 million people partake in some form of fishery experience each year, and the federal lands administered by the Forest Service contribute significantly to this very important and popular form of recreation. The Forest Service is responsible for, for managing the habitat, the actual environment that the fish require to live in, whereas the state agencies that we coordinate our activities with and work very closely with are responsible for managing the fish themselves and for setting the state fishing regulations and enforcement of these regulations. Two major aspects of Forest Service management of fisheries includes habitat improvement and, and coordination with, with fishery needs with other land use activities. The Gallo National Forest, which is just one of 156 national forests in the national forest system, alone has 1,300 miles of streams that are considered fisheries and 19,000 acres of lakes and reservoirs. Lakes on our national forest range from our small alpine lakes scattered throughout the high country to our larger reservoirs ranging from several hundred to several thousand acres in size. If the Forest Service is going to continue to meet the ever-increasing public demands being put on forest products, as well as the high-quality fisheries that we have here, it's ab ab absolutely necessary that, that the fishery biologists on the forest and the specialists that manage their resources on our forest work close together as a team with common goals of proper land management. Well, it'd be nice if we didn't have to build any more fence up there. If that piece you, if you put that piece in this year and it's, if it works, we'll stop right there. Part of my responsibilities here with on the forest is to administer the, the grazing that occurs on national forest lands. Uh, individuals, uh, private landowners here in the valley graze livestock on federal lands. To do that, they pay a fee, and uh, we work with them to establish the, the season that they graze, the locations that they graze, and the, and the system that they follow while they're on the national forest. The uh, livestock utilize a portion of the grass and then leave a portion of the grass for the elk. We're fortunate here in that the steep south slopes are uh, not used by the cattle in the summertime and they're left for the for the elk in the wintertime. Grazing permittees that uh, run their livestock on the forest are not only required to pay a fee for grazing on the forest but they're also to uh, maintain fences and springs and, and make improvements to the range. These improvements are used to regulate the cattle grazing so that uh, no particular area gets overgrazed or, and there's no resource damage occurs. We're standing here in front of the old mill buildings from the Jardine Mining Company, which was producing gold in the early 1920s. Since the 49ers found gold in California in the mid-1800s, prospectors have looked all over the west in the Rocky Mountain region for valuable minerals. A lot of the mineral deposits that have been found have been found on federal lands which are managed by the Forest Service. The Forest Service must encourage responsible and legitimate exploration, production of mineral deposits on Forest Service lands and at the same time protect the other surface resources that are out there. In 1872, Congress passed the mining laws which opened essentially all federal lands including the Forest Service lands uh, open for location of mining claims. Today the Gallatin Forest has over 5,300 mining claims. These claims have been located for such minerals as gold, silver, and essentially platinum and palladium. There are various other tracts located around 
where they have been looking for molybdenum, tungsten, copper, nickel, and other metallic and non-metallic minerals. Now, in the Gallatin Forest, there are over 5,300 mining claims, which cover 106,000 acres. Now, these 5,300 claims are about 20 active mining operations at the present time. The other activity we have in the forest presently is oil and gas leasing. In 1920, Congress set several minerals aside to be leasable minerals. The, the two most popular ones are coal and oil and gas. Until recently, there was not very much interest in oil and gas leasing in the, in the Gallatin Forest or in the Rocky Mountain region as a whole. Uh, mining companies, oil and gas companies, would rather drill in an area with simpler geology and have a better chance of success than to drill in the Rocky Mountains where there's very complex geology. We have not on the Gallatin had any oil and gas drilling for exploratory wells, but there have been several wildcat wells drilled on private lands that are adjacent to the forest. My job mainly entails working with mining companies and oil and gas companies. Uh, I feel we're kind of a middleman between our management and the oil company to make things go smoother. The building behind me, Spanish Creek Guard Station, is what we call a cultural resource. And my job involves managing the cultural resources in the Forest Service. We consider this a cultural resource because, broadly speaking, cultural resources are the remains of human behavior. And in this case, the Spanish Creek Guard Station embodies several important and significant aspects uh, of a cultural property. It was built in 1935 by the Civilian Conservation Corps, and therefore it is directly associated with a, a monumental social program to uh, address poverty in the 1930s. It's also important as a, an embodiment of the way Forest Service managers at one time uh, in our history, some 50 years ago, managed the natural resources in the land. It's totally without conveniences, and uh, uh, for our workforce today, it would probably be unacceptable uh, to the majority of them. But at that time, conveniences were not important to people, and this was just the manner the job was accomplished. On my job, if I happen to go out and do an inventory for a timber sale, one of the important things I'm trying to do is locate all of the cultural resource sites in the timber sale area. They can be either prehistoric or historic. Some of the things we might find on a prehistoric site are projectile points. And some of the things that we might learn from these projectile points are one of the two basic questions archaeologists ask of every site that they encounter. That is, the first, how old is it? And the second, what was it used for? Or what function did the people put this particular locality uh, to use? How did they use it? You may find a broken Paleo-Indian projectile point like this, a point used with a short spear. And among the things that this would tell you was that the site was approximately 8,000 years old, and that the people were their system evolved around hunting uh, big game, chiefly e extinct forms of bison. A little, a little later down in the aboriginal cultural history, you might find a projectile point like this, which is dated to around 4,000 years ago. Uh, these people had a different cultural adaptation to the environment, but they were still basically big game hunters. Finally, if you found a projectile point such as this one on an archaeological site, you would know that it came from very late in prehistory, say around AD 500. Uh, this is basically a very early type of bow and arrow projectile point. As I said, one of the basic jobs or one of the basic questions that archaeologists ask of their site is how old. On a historic site, you may find an artifact like this, which is uh, known as a hole and cap can. If you know the history of uh, technology, you know that these particular can types were in use from approximately 1820 until just after the turn of the century. Again, it's a way to help you date the site. Some artifacts not only will give you a date, for example, this hand-blown wine bottle, uh, we know uh, th this sort of technology ended about 1860. Uh, it also tells us what sort of behavioral patterns the people in this mining camp were, uh, were engaging in. Uh, to bring this sort of a luxury into a remote mining camp tells us uh, a fair amount about trade route, transportation routes, and uh, the energy people would expend to have a few luxuries around them even in the wild. National forests offer a wide range of settings for recreation. I like to think that we offer something for everybody from uh, 
real pristine wilderness where you can go on a 10-day backpacking trip or take a horse off hunting somewhere to a developed resort or a ski area. We have a lot of rivers where people fish and kayak and canoe and lakes where people like to ride in their motorboats and fish. We've got snowmobile trails, miles of hiking trails and horse packing trails. We have developed campgrounds, picnic sites, and these all work together, I think, to uh, give a lot of choices to people uh, who, who want something different. Um, that this is public land for everyone to use, and we try to uh, not put too many restrictions on the kinds of use, as long as it's not causing some kind of resource damage to the land itself. Beyond what is required by law, we prefer to use uh, instruction as to how people can minimize their impacts on the, the country, whether you're in a developed campground or out in the back country, so that we don't have to impose restrictions. We have uh, a lot of roads on the national forest that serve as great ski trails or snowmobile trails in the winter. Um, people use them for gathering firewood and berries. And uh, we have many trails also. Uh, and just open country where people can roam around and be free of the restrictions that we have in towns and cities. Behind me is the Spanish Peaks part of the Lee Metcalf Wilderness, which was designated in 1983. It's part of the National Wilderness Preservation System and is representative, I think, of some of the, the mountainous scenery that uh, we've chosen to preserve it as a society for the future generations, for wildlife, for scientific study, and for primitive recreation. Uh, there are a lot of uses that are compatible. Uh, wilderness allows multiple uses within it, but it doesn't allow motorized vehicles or roading or other mechanized means of travel. We've actively chosen to preserve these places to try to, to keep a little part of our natural heritage left intact so that people can remember what it's like to go up into a totally wild area like our ancestors did. And uh, I've heard statistics that say that there are about 2% of, of the total land area in the U.S. that is wilderness in this preservation system, and that's the same amount as what is under pavement. So uh, to me, it's a precious thing. Um, we used to have nothing but wilderness on this continent only 200 years ago and we've managed to to develop so much of it that now instead of being the big obstacle that we have to conquer the challenge for wilderness is how to preserve what we have left the national forests are really islands of natural resources and opportunities they're places where the American people can go and reflect on their heritage. We, as managers of those national forests, are here to care for those lands and to serve those people.